Grace and peace to you from the one who loves you and saved you by sending his son to be your savior. Amen. Word of God for our consideration this morning is the portion of the text that Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 4, discussing how it was that Abraham was saved. Paul begins that section by asking, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? We'll continue to see what Abraham discovered regarding his salvation. In the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through whom we have eternal life, dear friends. This past week, my wife and I got three applications for credit cards in the mail. It was a little unusual to get three in one day, but it's not unusual for us to get three in a week. It seems like Everybody wants to give us their money, but it's not always that simple, is it? 2.3 credit cards per person is what I'm told the average American adult holds. And on those 2.3 credit cards, the average monthly running balance in 2016 was $5,551. That's not car mortgage or car leases or purchases or house mortgages. That's just credit card debt, up over $1,000 from 2015. So it seems like those people that are sending out those credit cards are getting some people to accept and use them. Used responsibly, those credit cards can be a blessing to us, but used irresponsibly, they can become a great burden to us. With their buy now and pay later temptation, Sometimes it's easy to accumulate more credit card debt than what you are comfortable with on your income. But used responsibly, credit cards can be a benefit to us and can help us in many different ways. Well, whether or not we have credit cards or credit card debt, there is a debt that we all have, a debt that we incur and increase and build and mount every day of our life. It's the debt that we owe to our Lord because of the sins that we commit. And every day that we live, that debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and there really is no possible way for us to begin to dig ourselves out from underneath that debt. We have obligations to live according to God's will, God's law, and each day we fail to do that. And as we fail to do that, the responsibility then for the guilt of our sins begins to weigh on us. And perhaps it begins to overwhelm us. The person that wrote Psalm 130 said, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? If you, O Lord, sent us a balance ledger every month for the sins that we, could have, that we have committed, who could possibly stand under that weight? And so each of us realizes that this debt is something that there's just no possible way for us to even begin to relieve ourselves of. And that can lead us to do one of two things. Either to despair and say, well, then what's the use? I might as well make the debt as big as I can and enjoy life. Or we can listen to our Lord and hear his reassuring promise that although there was nothing that we could do, there was something that God could do, and he promised first to Abraham and, or to Adam and Eve that he would do that, and repeated that promise through Abraham, and repeated it throughout the Old Testament into the Gospels of the New Testament where Jesus came and did what God promised he would do to completely erase the balance on our spiritual credit card. Today we want to consider just how that balance went from insurmountable to zero, just like that. And as we review what God tells us, we'll praise his plan for canceling our debt. We'll first of all look at what he did for us and then consider what our reaction should be. This section of God's word confronts us with that spiritual debt that we have all incurred by our sinfulness. In chapter 3, the chapter that precedes our text in the letter to the Romans, Paul had said, There is no one righteous, all have sinned. And our sins have a mass that 
huge debt that we owe to our God. Now when we check our spiritual account balance, we realize we don't have the funds to cover that debt. And that might make us, first of all, consider, well, what, what can I do then to try to get rid of that debt? The Jewish people living at the time that this text was written thought that they had an answer to that question. They looked back to the Old Testament and they looked back to their forefather and patriarch Abraham and they read that God considered him righteous. God considered him a man of great standing. And they said, we're from his bloodline. If we do what Abraham did, God will also declare us righteous, free of that debt. And so they looked into God's law and they considered the law Moses had given to them, the ceremonial laws that God had given, the civil laws that God had assigned to the children of Israel, and they turned it into a, a checklist. And they believed that if they just checked off enough of those boxes, it would chip away at that debt until finally their spiritual ledger would say balanced zero. But Paul was sent by God to ask them a question. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? He says, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul posed that all important question. Why did God consider Abraham righteous? When you look back, Abraham had done a number of very God-pleasing things, even some difficult things. 75 years and successfully building a, a career and a life in Haran, and suddenly God appears and says, I want you to move, I'm not going to tell you where, but pack your things and follow me. And Abraham didn't say why or where or how. He said, okay, packed his things, and God led him to Canaan. When he finally was given a child that he had waited 25 more years from, God at one point came to him and said, I want you to take your child up to the top of a mountain and kill him and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham didn't say why or what about or how come or this doesn't make sense, but he took Isaac up to the mountain where he was willing to kill him before God intervened and provided a ram instead. So perhaps you can understand why the Jewish people would look at Abraham and say, no wonder God said he was righteous. He asked him to do so many good, difficult things, and Abraham willingly did them, and God said, check mark, check mark, check mark, balance zero. So if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But then Paul says, but that's not what God saw. He says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The faith of Abraham wiped out that debt, not the life that Abraham led. The law brings wrath. If you try to show God how good you are by what you do, God will see all those little hidden sins. Remember, Abraham once told a lie that his wife was his sister, and it ended up getting her put into a harem. Instead of trusting God and saying, yes, this is my wife, he was afraid they might kill him so that they could take his wife, so he lied. Abraham didn't always walk perfectly in the eyes of God. So it was not his good deeds and obedience that wiped out that debt. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. But it, can, it, can it really be that easy if your mountain of debt just continues to grow that you just say, I believe in Jesus, and it goes away? Consider what Luke recorded in chapter 23 as Jesus hung dying on the cross. A thief who was being executed next to him for crimes he had committed, and they didn't put petty thieves on crosses. This was a man who had, who had committed great crimes. In fact, he said to the other thief, we are getting what our deeds deserve. We are supposed to be here because of what we did. This is what we merited by our actions. And yet, throughout the day, he heard the story about this other man being crucified. 
And maybe he had been in Sunday school as a child, maybe he had heard the promises of a Messiah, but the Holy Spirit suddenly sparked that faith in his heart and he turned to Jesus and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In spite of all of the things that I did, things for which I am being crucified justly, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Clear out my debt. And Jesus didn't say, you didn't do enough good things. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Consider some of the other examples that Jesus gives us of people whose balance was shown to be zero. At the time the children of Israel were going to cross into the promised land, they, they did a tactful, tactful thing and they sent spies in to look at the land. They wanted to see what they were facing, and ten of them came back and said, oh, no, we can't do this, but two came back and said, the Lord wants us to have this land. Let's go take it. But while they were there, they were being pursued by the Canaanites, and a prostitute named Rahab housed them and then helped them escape. And that prostitute is included in the genealogy of Jesus? Now, obviously, God was not rewarding her for the sinful lifestyle she had chosen, but her faith was, was small, her faith was weak, but she knew that these were men of God and that she should protect them and help them. And her faith in that promised Messiah wiped out that life of sinfulness. We heard about a woman that Jesus met at the well in our gospel reading. And after a little small talk and Jesus asking for a drink, he finally says, go, go bring your husband to me. I want to talk to him. Oh, I don't have a husband. Jesus, knowing all hearts, said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You're living with someone who's not. And you've had five who you left. But I want to give you living water. I'm not going to reward you for the adulterous lifestyle you've lived. I'm not offering you heaven because of those things that you did. I am offering you heaven in spite of what you've done. I will give you living water. And she said, I know Messiah's coming. We, we've been taught about this Savior. And then Jesus said, I'm him. And I'm sure the conversation continued and that woman expressed her faith. And so it wasn't about you did enough good things in your life, so come drink our water. And so in the same way, Jesus says to us, you have a mountain of debt, and you need to have that debt removed, and I'm not going to ask you to do enough good things in your life to remove every single sin you've committed. I'm not going to ask you to pay a single dime. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead people can't do anything to help themselves. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous. God's plan was played out in the story of Lent, the story of Good Friday, the story of Easter. God sent Jesus to live the perfect life that was required and then to offer us the rewards for that life. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul would write to the Ephesians in chapter 2. You're going to heaven, but not because of what you did. You're going to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. When you stand before God, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, he will open your balance sheet and it would say zero. I don't remember ever having any huge debts completely erased for me. That usually doesn't happen in life. But imagine if that did. If you got yourself in so deep you could never dig out of it and then somebody said, I've taken care of it for you. Wouldn't you feel some gratitude toward that person? And wouldn't you want to do something in return, if not just send them a card? So what do we do for Jesus? What do we do in our lives to say, thank you for clearing out my spiritual debt? Paul gives us 
some thoughts on that question when he writes in the second half of the text, if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no trespass. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Paul poses some interesting thoughts there. He again says, now, now if heaven is connected to the law and the law was given to Abraham and to his descendants, the children of Abraham, and if by observing that law they can then get into heaven, then they really don't need God's promise. The promise is for those who can't get themselves into heaven. But if God made that promise, it's because you can't get yourself into heaven. And the law was given so that we would understand that. What if I would tell you there's rules about coming to Tree of Life to worship? And they've been in effect for three years since I got here, and I haven't told you what they are, but you're all responsible for them. And here's one. If you wear blue shirts, you're in trouble. You never told us. That's not fair. So we get to judgment day, and we haven't been given any laws, and God says, you shall have no other gods. Don't misuse my name. Remember I Sabbath day. Honor, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery. You never told us. So there is no awareness of sin if there is no law given. But last week we heard sin was in effect from the time of Adam and Eve through Moses even before written laws were given, which indicates because of the death that took place, death is a result of sin, sin is a result of breaking law. There were laws. There are laws. And so why do we have laws now? Paul just said the laws can't get you to heaven because you can't keep them. But why does the Bible tell us that Abraham was a righteous man and walked in the ways of the Lord? After he was forgiven, he took those laws and said, how can I say thank you, Lord? And he took those laws that were in his heart, hadn't been written down yet, that came through Moses, but took those things that he knew God wanted him to do and said, these are my guidelines for walking in the ways of God. This is how I say thank you that he promised to save me from my sins. And now Paul says that that promise is guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, all who recognize that that huge spiritual debt was canceled completely by faith in Jesus, and now all who walk in thankfulness of faith, as Abraham did, will be children of Abraham. And God says, I have made children of many nations. All who believe in Jesus, as Abraham believed in Jesus, will be saved, their debt is canceled, and that leads us to say, what can I do for you? And now we have 10 clear guidelines given to us through Moses, repeated in the New Testament by Jesus, summarized by Jesus as love God and love your neighbor. Love God and you'll keep the first three commandments. Love your neighbor and you'll keep the other seven. And by doing those things, you say thank you to God. Pretty simple. Let's go out and do it. <sighs> then we go out and the world surrounds us. And the devil, the world, and our flesh tell us, don't do those things. You have a right to do your thing. Everybody else is. Not only are they not being punished, but they seem to be thriving. And the devil is nudging us along down the path of sinfulness. And we see that debt starting to grow again. So instead of saying thank you to God, we have again disobeyed him. But God's promise is an eternal promise. There are no bounds to it, no limits to it. And every time we come back to the foot of the cross and lay another credit card ledger on his feet, he pays it, and he says, you have a zero balance again. And he gives us another opportunity to go out and live according to his laws and to show our thankfulness for what he has done for us. 
And in order to do that, we need to have what Abraham had, and that is faith. Faith is the fuel that guides us through life. Faith is the fuel that enables us to walk in the ways of God. And faith comes from hearing the message, from reading your Bibles, from going to church and Bible study. Faith comes through the Lord's Supper and baptism. No other way. Faith doesn't come from going to the beach or the baseball game. Faith doesn't come when you get a hole in one. Faith comes from hearing the message. We can do those other things, but it'll be useless to do those other things at the expense of building our faith when we have opportunities. Because at the end of the day, when God calls us to stand before him, he's not going to look at our tan and tell us it's nice enough to let us come to heaven or ask us how many hole-in-ones we've had or what our handicap in golf is. He's going to look into our hearts and say, do you believe in Jesus as your Savior? And if we've fueled our faith so that the devil can't steal Jesus from us, he will say, zero debt you owe me. Come live with me forever. And that will lead us to then thank and praise him eternally in his presence to enjoy the blessings that heaven affords us. And that's what we look forward to. And that's what motivates and guides us in our life to live according to his will. Abraham was a righteous man in the eyes of man. He was a God-fearing man, still a sinner. But he lived his life in praise of God for the promise he'd been given. His faith made him righteous. His righteousness made him faithful. Fill your hearts with faith and God will enable you to be more faithful to him. We thank God for sending that Savior to take away our sins, and through faith in him, giving us the strength to live according to his will. May he be with us all the days of our life until we can walk into the, heaven, the gates of heaven to live with him forever. Amen. And the peace that God gives us, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offering for the Lord will now be gathered.